introduce you to the Vice President of Business Development, Global Wide Media, Amber Paul. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Compliance Mastery Tips for Legal Landing Pages session. Today, I'm going to be your moderator. Um, quick background on myself. As mentioned, I'm the Vice President of Business Development for Global Wide Media. At Global Wide, we specialize in online affiliate marketing. Today we have a panel of three very experienced attorneys in the online marketing space. I'm going to do introductions for each one of them. First we have, we have Mr. Aaron Kelly. So Aaron is the founder and senior partner of uh, Kelly Warner. Um, Aaron's client list includes some of the top affiliates, websites, networks, and marketing agencies in the world. In addition to speaking engagements and being a published author, Mr. Kelly has earned one of the most prestigious awards a lawyer can receive. He's received an AV rating from the Martindale Hubble. I don't know what that is. He'll have to elaborate on the Fort Worth later. In addition to his firm, Mr. Kelly is also one of the founders of Snap Terms, which has also been featured on TechCrunch. Kelly Warner has offices in Arizona, Michigan, Texas, California, and will be opening a New York office soon. So, Mr. Aaron Kelly. Thank you. And next, we have Sarah DiDiego. Ms. DiDiego is an experienced internet attorney, and she's also the founder of DiDiego Law. She represents a variety of networks, advertisers, publishers, software and data providers, and many other companies involved, involved in affiliate marketing. Her practice focuses on helping clients maintain compliance with the constantly changing laws and regula regulations that impact affiliate marketing. Among other things, her time is spent reviewing and approving creative materials and landing pages, drafting and negotiating contracts, defending against regulatory action in civil litigation, and assisting in general business matters. She's an active member of the Performance Marketing Association and is also a, on the chair of the PMA uh, Attorney Interest Group. Ms. Sarah Diego. You guys haven't figured out by now. I'm a tiny bit nervous, but I'll ease up in a few. Next, we have C.J. Montgomery. Uh, Mr. Montgomery. Mr. Montgomery has been a merchant in the space for over 11 years. He is one of the founding members of a Wheeler, Montgomery, Slate, and Boyd Law Offices. Mr. Montgomery also does a lot of focusing on will and estate planning, business formation, and criminal defense in addition to his internet law practice. He is a frequent speaker, and he also does a lot of speaking for DMC notices, UDRP complaints, intellectual property rights, and advertising and compliance issues. So this will be our panel. I'm going to kind of do a quick little introduction on what we will be speaking on. Uh, many of us know that compliance is kind of the industry thorn, but at the end of the day, it is what governs um, affiliate marketing. So as far as the audience goes, I kind of wanted to gauge um, what brings everybody here. Do we have a lot of advertisers in the audience? Do we have a lot of affiliates in the audience? A lot of networks? Yes. <laughs> All of the above? Okay. So let's, uh, let's begin. Sarah, I'm going to start with you. Can you please begin in letting us know why compliance is important in affiliate marketing? Oh, yes, Amber, I can. <laughs> um, as I'm sure everybody here knows about the Federal Trade Commission, um, an excellent organization that does regulate what we all do. Um, the main thing that we're going to talk about today is um, truth in advertising rules and how they apply to affiliate marketing. Um, obviously, there's a lot of different areas of compliance, but that's what we're going to focus on today. And we'll start with uh, the truth in advertising rules, which ones apply to advertisers. Um, under the Federal Trade Commission Act, advertising must be truthful and non-deceptive. Advertisers must have evidence to back up their claims, and advertisements cannot be unfair. These, are, these three rules are basically the crux of what regulates our industry. Your advertisements have to be truthful, and they can't be deceptive. It's very simple, but yet so hard to do for a lot of people. Advertisers, you have to have evidence to back up your claims. So if you're claiming that your product is the, you know, will reduce wrinkles by a thousand percent, you should have some proof behind that. Obviously, you wouldn't be able to have proof of that, but um, a lot of 
a lot of what we see is advertisers just making things up. Their product's the best, they're the number one site, they're you know, the top of everything without having anything to back it up. And finally, advertisements cannot be unfair. You can't promise things that you can't deliver on. You can't trick people into buying your product, signing up for your service. Um, so our next slide is, so Sarah, if you could please further elaborate on what would actually make an advertisement deceptive. Well, yes, I can. Um, according to the FTC, policy statement on deception, um, which came out a few years ago. An ad is deceptive if it contains a statement or omits information that is likely to mislead consumers, acting reasonably under the circumstances, meaning when you look at a landing page or, or you're creating your offer, um, look at it from the point of view of a reasonable consumer. It's just regular old Joe reads your advertisement, what are they gonna get out of it? Are, you, are your claims going to trick them? Um, is what you're saying going to make sense to the reasonable consumer? Because that's how the FTC looks at it. They don't look at it from the point of view of a doctor or a smart person or what, anything other than just the average reasonable consumer. Um, second, is the claim material? That is, is it important to the consumer's decision to buy or use the product? So if the claim that you're making in your advertisement um, is, kind, is the basis of your product, it, it's what's going to make the consumer decide to buy your product or not. That's also what the FTC looks at. So if you're making claims that are just ancillary to what else is on your page, doesn't really have much to do with it, then that's not what they're so concerned about. What they're concerned about is the claims that are material to what you're advertising. So mm -hmm. CJ, being that you're a merchant and there's a couple of merchants in the audience, would you like to add a little bit to that? Um, absolutely. From from the average merchant's perspective and certain affiliates and networks, most of these, most of us, most of these people probably have a little bit sharper standard. They look at something and they go, well, that can't be true. That's not right. And so we, we're a little bit more suspicious of advertising. And we tend to think, well, everybody that's going to read this type of thing is going to apply the same standard. But unfortunately, they usually don't. The FTC, unfortunately for merchants, generally goes with a, a less intelligent view. It's, it's, as one of my uh, clients says, it's the sheep view. It's the people that would just follow along and believe anything they see. So as a merchant or as an advertiser, when you're putting out ad claims and stuff, you can't just assume that the person's going to do a little research or realize that there's got to be a catch or a trick. If you don't spell it out for them, unfortunately, the FTC takes a, a pretty hard look at that. Um, they'll look at both of what you say expressly and what's implied. If you say, lose 20 pounds in two weeks, well, that's pretty express. If you say, if you show a picture of a very large obese woman and then next to someone dressed very similar that's you know, 30 pounds lighter, you're not exactly saying they took that product and had these great results, but the assumption is it's implied that, well, if I take this, it's reasonable to assume I'm gonna go from really obese to being slim in two weeks. So when the FTC starts looking at what you've seen, or what you've said on your pages and stuff, often what you don't say gets you in almost more trouble than what's written on the page. There's a little bit of a misconception, it seems, in affiliate marketing, where in a lot of cases, the advertiser, merchant, and the affiliate seem to think that the network is actually the one who is liable for reviewing all of this, and that the content that's provided by the network, they would always be the one held liable should the FTC come after them. Sarah, can you elaborate on that uh, myth a little bit for us? Why, well, yes, I can. I think, are we going to the next one, too? Yeah. No. No. Keep going. No. Keep going. Nope. We have to start over. This is our next one. If the ads is up there. He already did that one. Just go to the LP, I think. No, we're already here. What does the FTC determine if the ads is up there? We've already done this one. Or we did that one. <coughs> okay. There we go. So let's go to the landing page then. Sounds yeah. good. All right, we're going to go ahead and look at um, a landing page now. And some of this is real. We pulled from a few different offers that we saw, um, and then some of it has been added in. We'll go through it and just kind of point out some of the things that are terrible about it. Some of the things that maybe aren't so terrible or that you don't realize are. I think, Aaron, you want to start? Yeah. Well, I was kind of excited to do something like this because uh, there's not many attorneys out there that will kind of, you know, design a landing page and then kind of rip it apart in front of their clients or potential clients or whoever. Uh, and so I had a guy design it, and we actually just went and ripped one of CJ's pages. This is all CJ's. Um, 
No, so the biggest thing when I look at this page, the, the first thing that I do when I'm doing a compliance review is, um, you know, I, I tell my clients exactly what they're going to expect. And so when I'm going through this page, the first thing I see is uh, the top left, women's health. Normally by itself, just the phrase women's health is fine. But the problem is it looks exactly like the magazine Women's Health. Now, this page isn't sponsored by, endorsed, or created by uh, Women's Health magazine. So uh, that's your, your first clue there's something wrong. Um, the second thing is it's using the magazine cover. So what it's trying to do is it's trying to give this impression that you know this is endorsed, or sponsored by, or created by Women's Health, and it's trying to mislead consumers into thinking that these particular products then are endorsed uh, by Women's Health, which they obviously aren't. Um, you know, the, there's never one thing though, and I, I've always hammered this home, is there's never one thing that's, that's really going to catch the attention of, uh, and not just the FTC uh, or state agencies, but it's the totality of things. It's really the net overall impression you get from the page. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, the deceptive, uh, you know, use of the trademark women's health along with these pictures along with uh, you know the specific claim where it says uh, special report how to lose 18 pounds of belly fat in just one month with these two diet cleanses that celebrities use this may look familiar because it was something that a lot of the acai pages used a couple years ago um, and they, they really hammered it home that they can't say that unless there's some type of you know human clinical study that's been done to show that these are in fact uh, attainable um, if there was something that allowed you to lose 18 pounds of fat without diet or exercise, I would probably know about it and be on it. But, you know, there's nothing out there that, that's like that that, you know, was available over the counter. Um, so this, coupled with a couple other things on the page that we'll look at, are uh, what give us this net overall impression that this page is deceptive. Um, and, you know, what they really try to hammer home is that, um, you know, it's you know, going back to you know what we were talking about earlier with the FTC, you know it's misleading consumers into thinking that this actually is doing what it claims to do, and it doesn't do that at all. I think what's amazing to me about this one and a lot of the ones that I still see is that the FTC cracked down so hard on you know last year on all of the Channel Nine News, Channel Three News, Channel Four News, the fake, the flogs, the made up, and they were all exactly like this. Where like this one, staff reporter Helen. Hasman investigates a weird weight loss solution. There's no Helen Hasman, or if there is, she didn't do this. And then it goes on you know, to tell her story of how she tried the product, she lost all this weight, et cetera. Um, and that's exactly what put almost 10 companies out of business last year, mm -hmm. is these exact type of ads. So it's amazing that people still do this. Every day I see this, the fake stories, and they're just completely made up. You see it here, you see it in the infomercials, you see it on all kinds of these products where the person who's telling the story doesn't exist. Um, and that right there, it, so it makes the entire thing false. The entire ad is false and deceptive because this person who tried the weight loss doesn't even exist. They're not real. Sir, I have a quick question for you actually relating to the videos on the right side. A lot of different merchants, different affiliates, they've pulled these videos off of YouTube. I think that it's okay to use them because they're available for anyone and everyone. Why would this make the landing page also deceptive? Well, Aaron, why don't you take that? Well, it, it does give the impression that it's still being endorsed by, you know, whoever's in the video. If it's Dr. Oz, I still see it all the time on the page. They'll have the product and they'll have a, the video from YouTube of Dr. Oz talking about the product. Um, you know, by itself, it wouldn't be misleading, but in totality, again, it would be. Just because you've got Dr. Oz on a video talking about this particular product, maybe not the exact product, but he's talking about all these wonderful benefits of it. And when they're watching that and looking at the page, you know, the net overall impression, again, that you're gonna get is that, okay, Dr. Oz is approving this particular product. Um, and I've seen guys even try to say underneath, you know, this page is not endorsed by Dr. Oz. And I've seen some people that actually have like, the image of Dr. Oz at the very top with a quote, with a video, and I just kind of shake my head because um, you know, he has threatened to go after people. He's actually done some episodes where he's uh, outed quite a few different pages uh, from affiliates talking about how he had, you know, he didn't endorse those particular products. Um, so, you know, you're using the video, uh, it, it's usually, you know, coupled with you know the specific claims, or they're trying to say that you know Oz is endorsing their product. Uh, again, you know, 
the, the net overall impression is, is that it would be deceptive. And also, it violates uh, you know, several laws with trademark or copyright because it's using his image uh, really without his permission. Dr. Oz can control how people use his image. And if you're using it to promote a product that he doesn't even know about, um, he, that would be actionable against you because you're using it for commercial purposes. Even though it's on a free you know, video site, uh, I've still seen people get you know, CNDs from Dr. Oz uh, because it looks like he's impliedly saying that the product is endorsed by him. And that would be the same from any of the news cast reports as well, Fox News special, yeah. CBS, all in the same line. Yep. Does anybody have questions on the first landing page mock that we have? Well, just to follow up to what you stated is the worst thing is not recommending if they do this, but the worst case is you just take it down, right? No. Most, a lot of people kind of take that approach. <laughs> um, and sometimes, like an, a Dr. Oz, for example, sometimes what they do is they do just send a cease and desist, and somebody says, oh, sorry, I got my hand slapped, but I didn't know. But some of these guys, the other guys, they skip that. They just go straight to a lawsuit. And unfortunately, you don't have the excuse of, well, they never warned me. Mm -hmm. If they want to file a lawsuit against you and, and skip the, the cease and desist letters, they very often do. And there's really no credible defense of, well, I wasn't aware, or I didn't know they didn't want me to do it, or, or anything of that nature. So I, mean, I think especially uh, like Oprah Winfrey started, her attorney started doing this to a lot of people that were using her image on things. Mm -hmm. That rather than sending letters and pleading with them to take them down or contacting hosts, they just filed lawsuits and included hundreds and hundreds of defendants. So it's usually, especially in this day and age, it's, it's, you have to be extra cautious and really aware because most of these guys have a lot of value tied up in their brands and their images and they're not gonna let the random affiliate blanket Facebook with their pictures saying, you know, this celebrity endorsed my product. And most of them will send their legal team out pretty hot and really early on before someone even knows they're, they're being watched. I think there's a misconception too with the uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA, that people they'll put like a notice at the bottom, you know, uh, DMCA copyright notice, contact me if you want me to take down images. Just because you have that at the bottom of your page doesn't mean that you're protected and just because uh, you know, they ask you to take it down doesn't mean they can't sue you. There are only certain circumstances where the DMCA will actually protect you. Um, and a little known fact, you actually have to register with the Copyright Office as a, uh, have a registered agent to actually get full DMCA protection. But in this case, it wouldn't protect you because you're actually hosting the images uh, that are, you know, copyrightable uh, themselves. So you, usually the person that's protected by the DMCA would be the, uh, the web host or um, in some cases maybe even the, even the network. But the DMCA isn't gonna protect you if you're the owner of the site and you're the one that is putting the pictures on there. Um, so I think a lot of people have this misconception of the DMCA that it's gonna uh, you know, give them a free, you know, get, a get out of jail free card. That if they put up this image that uh, you know, they're not gonna get sued. That's, and that's just not true. Any other questions? That's usually still considered commercial, even though it's a little bit indirect in your example. But, I mean, the question they look at is, well, why is this person being used on it? Because usually there's a, there's a reason that people are putting, like, a, like you said, a coach or somebody. And that coach is the person who's got ultimate rights to how their name is used, what context is used. And even if you're not selling anything with their name, you know, maybe you have a petition for a charity or something completely innocent, but if you start putting, you know, pictures of the president or Oprah on it, to, to attract more attention, you're still, you're still misusing their trademark rights. Should we the next one? So how do you know if something's in the public domain or not? I mean, if there's, a, like, if it's a coach who's died or a really popular coach and there's tons of pictures. They've died, I think, Aaron can, or Sarah can back me up. They have to have died more than 40 years before. I mean, they yeah. keep, the estate keeps yeah. rights in their names for decades after their death, so. Right, you couldn't just go use Michael Jackson. Yeah, yeah exactly, so. Away. You can't, unfortunately, you can't wait for someone to pass away and then start using their images and everything would be fine. So, 
in, in that scenario, it's usually the estate suing. But if it's somebody famous that you're using them because they're going to be recognizable to society, chances are there's, there's a lot of value tied up in their name. And somewhere there's an estate or there's family or there's an attorney that's going to defend it. Okay, so we're going to move on to a typical checkout page. So on that slide, in between. I'm sorry. There's one in between. Um, yeah. Uh, you want to go over the in-betweens? You want to keep going through these? Can never ask them. Yep. Okay, let's go to the next one. This is a, we'll elaborate a little bit more on this one. This would be just the, the in-between of a typical landing page. We're just kind of talking about, you know, what we were just talking about, the picture of Jennifer Aniston. Um, and it, next to it, it says, Jennifer Aniston used this diet to lose 18 pounds in just one month. She recommends this exact diet to anyone looking to lose body fat. And there's a before and after picture. Um, again, we're, I would assume that the person that has this offer doesn't have permission from Jennifer Aniston to use her images for commercial purposes. And also, I doubt she used the product. Um, and, and, you know, that would, you know, cause the result. So, you know, again, it would be an unauthorized use of, you know, her image, uh, and there would be issues with copyright, trademark, misappropriation. Um, what else am I missing? Uh, more than 18 pounds. There's not a lot of hard and fast rules, yeah. but the FTC is really hot on anything that says more than two pounds a week without any lifestyle change. That's just an immediate red flag. So adding that on top of using Jennifer Aniston's image is pretty much going to get a a, a pretty rapid inquiry and, and somebody's probably going to get slapped over it. Another thing on this um, page which we see in a lot are where it says free trials are limited, <coughs> expires, well this was the day that we copied the page, but expires on Tuesday, November 6th. Um, and I say that all the time. Um, offer only good today. Offer expires, whatever, January 14th, when it's not true. If you go back 24 hours later and click on the same link, that page is still going to be there. The date's just going to be the next day. And it's still going to say expires today. And it doesn't expire today. Um, that's something that I see on, I mean, tons and tons and tons of landing pages. And it's completely false and deceptive. You, to, you're creating a false sense of urgency with the consumer that the offer's only good that day, or the coupon's only good that day, when, in fact, it'll be good as long as the page is up. Um, so that definitely is something that you can't do. Um, another thing on here, if you see above that, it says use our exclusive coupon code SHIPSAVE to get shipping reduced. This also could be false and deceptive unless if the shipping isn't really being reduced. Whoever made this page was never going to charge $9.95 in the first place for shipping. They were always going to charge $1.95. Um, you see this a lot of putting a higher number and then pretending that there is some discount on it. If there really is no discount and you're not usually charging $9.95 for your shipping, then you can't say that it's discounted today because um, it's just not true. I don't know about you, Sarah, but one of the things I tell people is, you know, you can get creative with these things. Instead of saying expires on Tuesday, November 6th, uh, you know, maybe you have some input, but what about things like uh, order by midnight to get free next day shipping? Since if you order before midnight, you're going to get shipping the next day anyway. So something that's true that still can kind of create the sense of urgency, but still make it true. I, I've I've seen a lot of people do that, and that's always kind of, um, I, I think it's a creative workaround to it, and I haven't seen the FTC, uh, you know, say anything about that, but you... Yeah, I don't see a problem with that, um, and I see a lot of that people getting creative, saying, you know, um, 9.95 today, that's fine, it is 9.95 today, but it's when you say only today. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's just the change of one or two words that can make all the difference in the statement being truthful or being false. Likewise, this one says free trials are limited, which is usually okay since it's very hard to say what limited is. But you'll see a lot of pages that say only 500 free trials left or they'll have a, a fake counter counting down. And if that's not true, it's deceptive. But you can basically get the same conversion rate, the same kind of you know, reaction from people just by saying free trials are limited. And you've, you've, you've removed some of your potential liability by just wording it a little different. And you still capture the same benefit you're trying to get out of your, your marketing language. I've actually had some clients split test it to the language between you know free trials limited and the whole shipping thing and the conversion rate was actually better uh, with the compliant language so it's not always a case where you know becoming more compliant you're going to lose conversions um, other things on this page you'll see the comments what others are saying um, Jenny London from Britain well, these ones are made up um, this is another common thing on landing pages is to have so in so-called consumer quotes, um, and a lot of time they're just made up. Mm -hmm. The designer wrote his own little quote, 
put a name in there and plugged it in. Um, it's very common. Again, it's, it's deceptive. I mean, for the most part, this stuff is common sense. If you're making it up, it's deceptive. Do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question about the expiration dates on your offer. I mean, top billion dollar companies do that, and the expiration dates is all promoting. So is that the, should that not be get sued by the FTC about that? Well, it's fine if your offer really is expiring. <laughs> so that's the difference. <laughs> And a lot of times what they do, especially if their attorneys yelled at them, is they'll have something at the very bottom or something. And I don't think this necessarily is going to pass muster if an angry, you know, government regulation is, is looking at it. But at the bottom they say, you know, we reserve the right to extend this beyond its expiration. So, so there's little things you can do to sort of it's about take creative. the edge off that a little bit. Mm -hmm. But just, just because, and I mean, this is a, a common question, oh, I see, you know, so-and-so is doing it and they're making all this money and they're big. Just because they're big doesn't mean that what they're doing is okay. Um, they probably just have a lot more money to fight it if they get a fine. So being big and violating the law, okay, you just have more money behind you. Sarah, a question for you on the testimonials. Um, in most cases, a lot of these are made up, but a lot of merchants and affiliates are under the impression that they can go sign up a posting on Craigslist and have people try these fake testimonial, put together testimonials and have them try the product and sign some waivers. Can you kind of maybe shed some light on that? Because there's, um, I think, a lot of confusion around that one in the affiliate space. Sure. I mean, you can have people try your product. You can even pay people to try your product and to write a review, but you have to disclose that. Um, if you're getting paid testimonials, it has to say pay testimonial, and it has to say it right by the testimonial. It can't be three pages down at the very bottom in the fine print. Um, the FTC has made it very clear that you have to disclose if it's a paid endorsement right next to the endorsement or very, very close to it. Um, in fact, there's some examples on, on one of the earlier slides, which I believe you all get the slides. Um, there's some links to various FTC pages, um, and there's a very good compliant, advertising compliance guide that's on the FTC's website, and it even has examples of this stuff. Um, there's one for endorsements, too, and it has little boxes and pictures and gives you examples of what is okay and what isn't. Um, but, but you definitely, if you're, being, if you're paying for them, you do have to disclose that. Um, anything else about it? Yeah, um, the other thing on testimonials is people are always looking for a workaround in easy ways. They say, all right, so the testimonial has to be a real testimony from a real person. They call up their sister and say, hey, write something out, sign it, send it over to me. You know, it's still, going back to that, it's implied that that's somebody unrelated to you. So if you've got this raving endorsement but it's a you know, family member. It's better than making it up, but not by a lot. So, you know, the more people try to kind of skirt around the rules, I think the harder look, you know, government agencies start to take a look at that. So, right now, the best practice is usually is collect the testimonials from customers. And, you know, giving away free product isn't the worst idea to get valid testimonials and keep, you know, copies on file of anything you use. And you're seeing that more. A lot of networks are saying, hey, if you've got this, we, you need to send us a copy of of a signed endorsement of anybody you're using. And that's mostly because the networks are getting yelled at at the top, and now it's filtering down to their affiliates. What about like Fiverr, CJ? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, Fiverr's, a, Fiverr's an interesting one. I mean, the common thing now is post, hey, I need something really nice said about my product. I, I'll give you five bucks, and you can get wonderful ringing endorsements on Fiverr. But at the end of the day, they're doing that for the five dollars. You know that. <laughs> and your hope that that's going to protect you at the end of the day, he said it's it's better than nothing, but yeah. you're still getting into that. It's misleading because this person didn't write that testimonial for any reason other than earn $5. So anytime you have an endorsement on your site, you need to sign You don't have to, like on the site, but it's great to have because as soon as you're called out, if you say, hey, I've got it, I, we've had it on file for weeks, that you can, you can cut off an FTC inquiry or an attorney general inquiry very early on in a lot of cases. If you have a few of those and they say, well, this merchant, this advertiser has paperwork on the first thing we ask them about, they're probably more likely to be compliant, but they're at least more compliant. Let's go after the low-hanging fruit of the guys that are just abusing this and running reckless through. A lot of people do that, and I think that's valid. I mean, because even thrilled customers probably aren't going to take the time to sign an affidavit, but a printed off email in the file could could be the difference between an investigation going further than you want down the road and just, you know, stopping it early on. Sure. 
it's still it's still misleading though and false. If you're just paying people to write you testimonials for five dollars, <laughs> they're not actually trying your product and saying how wonderful it is, how your skincare product made their skin so much better. Isn't that what every commercial out there is? Mm -hmm. But but like for Fiverr, they're not actually trying your product. They're just writing you a review without ever having actually tried it or done whatever it is that they're reviewing. Um, it's different if you are sending out your product to someone, you know, you give, you actually live, give away free samples to people and they try the product and then they come back and say, yeah, this was great. Um, that's different than just paying someone to write a review without having ever even tried it. Celebrity endorsements have a slightly different standard because of exactly that. It's assumed, well, that's a celebrity. They're doing it because of who they are. But even when you see, like, you know, your late night infomercials, you see at the bottom all the tiny script that's always the disclaimers for exactly that. And while that's not, it, it works a little different in the, in the online world, um, you know, like the fiber videos, you'll see some of the bigger companies doing it. And at the end, though, they'll, they'll put the watermark of, hey, this may be a paid testimonial. But it's at the very end of the video where you, would, you wouldn't have kept watching. You can, you can get sued for anything. <laughs> I mean, was, unfortunately, everybody, there's not a good black and white rule on that. I think that's better than making it up. I think you're, you're getting further along that, that sh you know, along that spectrum of this is better than if I just absolutely made it up. Yeah. But we're still, I've got a little bit of exposure here. So the more you can do to make it clearer when, you know, an attorney general is looking at, at your actions after the fact, the better. So putting some of that afterwards or buried down in the bottom of the fine print is better than nothing, but you're still, you're still treading into a gray area a little bit. I'm just saying because I have a product that my clients don't want to show themselves. You know what I mean? I can't get a real testimonial because it's, it's, it's not. Um, and you probably shouldn't have them. Yeah. If they're not real, they're not real. I mean, it's, it's, it's common sense. If it's fake, it's fake. It's deceptive. I mean. Okay, so while we're on the topic of testimonials, let's go to another common misconception on landing pages, and that would be the commentary. I think we have a couple pages Well, we've already gone by a lot of these. I mean, we've gone over. Okay. They're pretty similar to the other slides. We've gone over the, I lost 18 pounds in four weeks, get a free trial copy. Yeah, this one on the, the comments, um, we see this a lot on landing pages. They're just fake, again. Um, sometimes I'll sometimes we'll see a lot, um, what I've been seeing lately is, taking comments from Facebook um, that are about a similar topic or just somehow plugging in a Facebook feed of comments and you'll read the comments to some product and it has absolutely nothing to do with it. I mean, nothing to do with it. Um, but it just looks good to have, you know, pages of comments at the bottom of your landing page. And, and it's the same thing. If they're fake, they're made up, it, they're false and deceptive. Um, it's pretty easy. If these are real comments, which I don't think these ones are, um, then it's fine. But a lot of times you can tell the difference between it's real comments or not because you can't add more comments. Um, it's just a static page. It's not the comment box doesn't really work. They just plug in a comment box and a bunch of comments at the bottom. Um, but it's the same thing. If they're not real, they're not real. There's a disclaimer that's commonly on landing pages that says comments have been closed by moderator or need to be reviewed by a moderator or a postmaster. How would that help with making something more compliant or does that still keep it uncompliant? Well, I mean, that's fine. When I see that though, I generally think that, again, they just made up all the comments because if you're having a comment section, it would be working. Not to say that it doesn't always. I'm sure in some cases, they really do close the comment box after a while. Um, I just so far haven't really seen any that they were real comments. Generally, when I see that, I'll go back, you know, to my client and say, hey, you need to ask your advertiser about this because I don't think these comments are real. And they'll go back and ask them. And the reply is always like, oh, yeah, we can remove those. I've never had an advertiser come back and say, oh, they're completely real. We just closed the, you know, comment box. If they're really legitimate comments about your product on your Facebook page, you want to put them on your you know, sales page, you can still copy them and oh, yeah. yeah. I think that's pretty much always valid. And the other thing you'll see on Facebook is sometimes it's not comments, but likes. And, and there's maybe still a little bit of disagreement about whether likes could ever be considered misleading because you know, anybody can find a couple websites you can buy 5,000 likes for less than you spent on coffee this morning. 
And people do it because, hey, if somebody comes to a, to a site, it's that, nat it's that kind of natural feeling we have. 3,440 people on Facebook like this page, it must be legitimate. Um, I would generally advise clients, I think that's okay, because you're only buying likes, you're not making something up, and maybe some of these people like it and some of them don't, but you can cross into a gray area pretty quick if you're, you know, copying likes from a competing product and changing the name or making up comments um, but putting real Facebook users' names on them. What about taking related comments from like, uh, like real actual comment testimonial from like Amazon and putting it on the site? Even though it's going to be technically the same actual comments from the product, but in almost the same respect to the two products. So. That's an interesting one, actually. I mean, I think you could say that's valid. You may have a problem with Amazon saying that's their copyright, yeah. but I think the comment. Oh, the question was like, taking comments from Amazon and uh, you know changing up some things and then posting on your side is. Well, not just changing, taking the actual comments from uh, Amazon itself, but actual testimonials and just putting it on your own site. Same so product or different product? It would, be, it would be technically almost in retrospective related to the same product. So you're selling cordless drills. You look up the exact cordless drill on Amazon that's sold hundreds of yeah, times to Amazon, be, and you, like you move it over. Ketone, but it's a raspberry ketone, but it's a specific brand in the comment. You know, it's still a raspberry ketone. I think that, that the question is um, for a diet product. Um, not your diet product, but another one that's still, a like, say, raspberry ketone, as you said. Um, it's another product, different name, maybe a different formula. You don't really know if you're just taking their comments because they're also raspberry ketone. I'd say that's deceptive yeah. um, because it's a different product. You don't know what formula is in theirs. Maybe it's slightly different than yours. They were, those people were commenting about that specific brand and what was in that box. How do you know, but what about if you know it is a white label product? That's you're at least getting in the gray area. Yeah, it, 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 that's actually kind of an interesting question because yeah. you, you could, you, I think you could reasonably and honestly say the, to you know, an investigator or something, hey, this is the product, I can prove it, I know the white label, I know the company that makes it, all these comments are about the exact formulation in here. But that white label is probably going to get. But that white, yeah, somebody else is probably I mean, going to be. You're violating that. different. You're violating different rules now because now yeah. you're copying their content, and they're going to send you a cease and desist and say, "Hey, we noticed you copied our comments. Take it down." Um, and of course, you can get sued for that, and that is pretty common. I mean, we see those all the time, all the time. So people are getting a lot more, you know, serious about their landing pages. So if they're going to invest time and effort into it to build something and then get people commenting, having people try their product, and then you come and just rip it from them. People don't like that. And it's getting a lot more common where people are actually, companies are actually going after other companies for copying their landing pages. So how much can you guys, how much can you edit a comment without getting in trouble? Can you, you know, just edit for grammar or can you edit like words because you're trying to spin the comment a little bit to make it different? It's a sliding scale, I mean. A lot of people will tell you know there'll be three sentences in a comment and two of them are positive and the one in the middle is not very positive. So they just sort of remove that middle one. Yeah, it's I think you're getting into deceptive there because you change the meaning of what the comment is. Now certainly if you just abbreviate it because it was eight pages of a ringing endorsement and you only wanted seven pages, that's probably not misleading in and of itself. But if you're taking stuff out or doing it for for exactly what you said to kind of spin it a certain way, I think you're you're treading into that deceptive I side. When I say spin it, I mean that's replicating it but having different words so that it looks like unique content. So if they said amazing using the word great. But then you're just making it up. Yeah. It's not a it's not a comment anymore because you're putting the words in yourself. Using the context of what they're saying. No. Just tweaking a few words. You're, you're making it up. Yeah. Yeah, I think that starts to get too it's not an objective standard. I mean, they said great and you used wonderful. Well, did those mean exactly the same thing? I think at that point you start to, you're getting away from what their comment was. I think in most cases, shortening something down for length is okay, but as soon as you change words other than, you know, spelling errors or something like that, I think you've gotten, gotten away from what that comment was. Spelling and grammar is usually fine. But if you used a screenshot, then you wouldn't really be duplicating content because you just take a snapshot. Is that legal or? Sorry, say that again. If you just took a snapshot, like a screenshot of the cap of the other From comments where? instead of typing the content onto your site, so you're not really 
having any duplicate content issues. You're just showing, you know, here's the com here's the comments. Well, I think that's fine because you're showing the original comment in its form. But you're are you taking anything. it from someone else? It'd be copyright I mean, infringement for Amazon. It, you're copying it from somebody else? Yeah, you may have a different problem. You may have yeah. a copyright problem. So it's only if it. it's your own comments on another site that you have or something like that where you own it. Or you own the rights to it, I guess? Amazon own the copyright of that other person's? They say yeah. they do. Yeah. I mean, I think that's open to some debate because that person doesn't have an, whoever wrote that comment doesn't have some signed agreement with Amazon. But the Amazon's position and they, they got a lot of uh, legal dollars to fight it is that they own the copyright, even though someone else wrote it. Okay, let's, uh, let's go to the next uh, slide that we have prepared. So we've gone over the overall landing page setup, and now we're going to take a look at an example of a checkout page for a skin product. Sarah, you want to start with this one? Mm -hmm. um, if you look at this page, it's a pretty common one. Actually, it's a real one. Um, you can, it looks fine. Um, it's talking about the product, it's got a promo code you can put in, there's somewhere for your credit card details, nothing wrong with this. Um, the problem is that when you go to the next slide, which had to be in two because this slides is just are the bottom so half of this page. is the bottom half of the page. Um, below the order now button, um, which is basically as far as people look, you, once you put in your credit card info and you, you click order now, you're not gonna look below that. Um, but on this actual page, if you were to scroll down, to the next, you'll see in really, really, really tiny font under the look great guarantee, and the little tiny font has nothing to do with looking great. Um, it says that you're paying $2.97 for shipping and handling for your 14-day free trial. Um, if you're satisfied, do nothing and be charged $94.28 for the trial bottle in 14 days. So at the, uh, the top of the page, it, it disclosed nothing about this. It just said you were getting a free trial of the product. And not until you look down in the really tiny font do you see that you're actually going to pay $94 for something in two weeks. By the time you get the product, I mean, you'll have like a day to try it. And no, you're not going to know that you signed up for this because no one's going to look down this tiny font. It's certainly a font that's under the heading of Look Great Guarantee. When you see a big heading that says look great guarantee, you assume whatever's in there is just kind of the standard guarantee language you've seen in your life. You don't expect a, a gotcha in there of, oh, by the way, we're going to charge your credit card, you know, $100 a month for the rest of your natural life. So I think hiding it under one of those headings like that is usually still misleading, even though I'm sure the merchant would say, hey, it's on the page where, where we check out. That's what Visa's told me I have to do. I'm, I'm complying with what I think is the letter of the law. But, but we all know you look at that. and. It, and us as markers would look at it with maybe a little bit more of a jaded eye, but the average guy on the street looks at it, nothing over by the credit card, I see a guarantee, sounds great, they put their credit card info in. Yeah, and there's actually, besides just being false and deceptive, um, there's actually rules that apply specifically to this, the next one, um, the California Business and Professions Code, um, this section here, specifically talks about this situation. And whether or not you're in California, the law still applies to you because you're going to market into California. I don't know anybody who leaves California out of there. That no one targets and leaves California out. So for the most part, it's going to apply to you regardless of what state you're in. Um, and you can you know, get sued under this even if you're in Michigan. It doesn't matter where you are. The, the internet, the, the laws apply to everybody. Um, what, what this law says is that it's unlawful for any business um, doing an auto renewal program or continuity program um, to fail to present the automatic renewal offer terms or continuous service offer terms in a clear and conspicuous manner before the purchase agreement is fulfilled. Um, that means specifically you have to disclose in that example the $94 that you're going to be charged in 14 days before the person puts in their credit card information. That means above or at least to the side of where they're putting in their credit card um, so it's disclosed ahead of time. It can't be disclosed down at the bottom. It can't be disclosed a page later when they get the thank you or just in an email, you know, two weeks from then. You have to disclose it ahead of time. And California actually goes on. Um, th there's some other rules about it too, but um, on the next slide, um, they define clearly and conspicuously um, as meaning in larger type than the surrounding text or in contrasting type, font, or color to the surrounding text of the same size, or set off by symbols or other marks uh, in a manner that clearly calls attention to the language. So on that slide we were looking at, um, it doesn't comply with any of that. Uh, what they're saying is that the, 
your font needs to be bigger, it needs to be bolder, it needs to be in some color, it needs to be in some way that draws the consumer's attention to what you're telling them, which is that you're gonna be charged $94. Things I commonly see are really tiny gray font on like a yellow background, nobody can read that. Um, that right there definitely violates it. Um, or, or the font is, you know, 0.6, it's so tiny, but the giant free trial is in 36 font. That violates it. What the law says is that your disclosure of the terms of the auto renewal program must be clear and conspicuous. And they give exact rules of how it is clear and conspicuous. If it's bigger, it's bolder, it's brighter, it's set apart in some way. I think now we're going to, uh, CJ, you're going to talk a little bit about the Visa MasterCard rules? Yeah. The Visa MasterCard rules, this is a bigger deal to, to merchants and offer owners than it is affiliates. Since affiliates generally don't capture the actual credit card information on their site, it's probably not as applicable to them. But these are the actual rules straight from Visa MasterCard. And the reason we include this is even though Visa and MasterCard, they're not, they're not a government agency. They're not going to put you in jail or do something if you don't comply by their rules. But they give you a real sense of, I mean, these are the 800-pound gorillas. The rules they lay out have come through a lot of talk with regulators. It's, it's going to be the, the, the best practices, the best standards out there. So looking to them gives you a, a pretty good idea of kind of where the industry's headed and you know, what types of things is going to get you in trouble. Um, these particular rules are the negative option requirements. It says new. They were supposed to be effective in June of last year. They're still a year before now. They're still not rolled out really across, across everyone. I should say this only applies to people running free trial and continuity for the most part. But according to this, a, an op, a merchant must comply with all of the following requirements. They have to obtain express consent from, dis, from the cardholder by disclosing all the terms and conditions prior. Okay, that's fine. The page we looked at earlier looked like it had it. It was just in tiny font. It says that should include but not be limited the name of the merchant, description, amount, date, the length of the trial period, the cancellation policy for everything. There's a lot of things that people oftentimes have three or four or maybe five of these, but they don't have them all. Um, if we go to the next slide real quick. Like I said, these are supposed to go in, in place uh, June 1st of 2011. And this is for the recurring transactions, the rebills. It says the, the requirement is to obtain a completed order form or written cardholder permission to periodically charge for recurring goods and services. Well, people don't usually get written permission. They interpret it, a checkbox as being, well, that's, that's, that's written permission enough. Um, but you see this written permission must include at least, but is not limited to telling them what the transaction amount is, how often it occurs, duration for how long they go, and most, most continuity things go on for forever until your credit card's canceled or you, you get wise to the fact that they're rebilling you. And also provide a simple and easily accessible online cancellation procedure. And most of these outfits don't have an online way to do it. They have an 800 number that may never be answered, but, but most of them don't provide this. At least these come from visas, so in theory, anyone who's taking a credit card should be complying with this. Um, scrolling down a little bit further, it says obtain subsequent written cardholder permission when a recurring transaction is renewed. What they're saying is every month the person who's on rebill should be agreeing to it again. Well, I haven't seen a rebill offer that does that. So we already know most people aren't complying with this. You know, as a merchant, your, your, your biggest risk on first and foremost is losing a merchant account because if you're not complying with this Visa or MasterCard could just shut you down and you're out of business. But, but maybe more importantly is, this is these rules have come into place when Visa and MasterCard work with outfits like the Attorney Generals and stuff. So if you're not following most of this with Visa, you're probably going to run afoul of you know, government regulators who have power to put you in jail, you know, stop your business, shut down websites, things that private companies couldn't do to you. So. You'll see at the end in bold, I say almost no continu continuity merchants are in full compliance with all these rules. So it's still, it's still a little bit of a gray area, but I think two years ago nobody complied with this. And then a year ago, most of this you start to see complying. And in the last year, you're seeing a, a, a much stronger push towards complying to the point where networks are requiring that their merchants and affiliates you know, provide documentation of how they're collecting checkbox, where's the terms and conditions. Um, I think that's only going to continue in the future. It's going to get stricter and stricter. So 
the earlier on you start kind of adjusting your business practices, the better. Well, and I think the Visa MasterCard rules were pulled from a variety of different state rules that are out there. They kind of put them all together to make their own rules to make sure that everyone's complying with all the state laws. I personally don't know all the state laws, um, but I do know that like the California law, in other states there's similar rules um, made to protect consumers. Um, and in the California one, there's also a rule that you have to um, provide your consumer with some form of an acknowledgement, acknowledging that they signed up for this, it's going to be a rebill, the terms of it, how to cancel, everything. Um, which means you physically need to send them an email or you send them a piece of paper. You have to send them something after they've put their credit card information in that confirms what they've signed up for and gives them all of the terms for the cancellation, how much you're charging them right there in an easily readable form that they can store and keep later. Um, and that's another thing that I really don't think anybody does. Um, but it's a rule, it is the law. And so I think what MasterCard Visa did is they put those, they took, kind of went around, took all those little rules and put them into um, one big statement for their clients. Let's go to our next slide. Yeah. Okay. So right here, um, we have uh, kind of a lot of your different logos on a landing page. I think there's a lot of misconception around logos on landing pages. I know we've talked about this a little bit, but Aaron, I was hoping you could elaborate on this for us a little bit. Yeah, the answer to uh, whether or not this is compliant just depends on you know your level of uh, risk taking. You know, some attorneys would say absolutely not. You can't do this at all. Uh, you know, we kind of talked beforehand, and we're kind of in agreement. I would think uh, as to when you could use the logos like this. Uh, you know, a lot of what I saw in the past was um, you know as seen on you know, and then would have picture of CNN or the logo for CNN, ABC, Yahoo. Um, which is mis you know, misleading and also the bigger thing, I guess, is that it uh, violates their trademark um, you know, for you know, CNN because the way the logo is designed, it's very specific, they have a trademark on that. So the issue is, is you know, when can you use somebody's logo? And it really just depends. Uh, I, I try to say, instead of saying as seen on, use the term as advertised on. It's usually a better way to, to, to say it. If you, you know, advertise on those sites, you have a big media buy or uh, you know you have a five hundred thousand dollar month advertising budget with Yahoo I don't think they would really care too much if you said as advertised on um, I, I haven't seen them go after somebody for that so even if you have you know been featured on some of these sites I, I say hyperlink to the article uh, there are some networks out there I've seen that will actually create different logos instead of having the the ABC is a circle they'll have a square or they'll they'll change it up a little bit or they'll have um, you know different colors for the logo so it doesn't look exactly like the logos uh, but it's still you can tell that's who it is it, you know again I think that's the least of the concern when I'm going through a page so I usually tell people is it okay not really but uh, it just depends on the context of the situation. You know, you probably haven't gotten permission to use their logos to advertise on your site, but if they've written an article about you know your particular product or offer, you know, just link to that product or, or offer, and uh, it you know it becomes a little bit more compliant. It's a little bit safer. Again, the the best thing you do is just you know not use it at all. But uh, I have some of my own sites where we've done that exact thing, where we've actually. You know, just hyperlink to the article uh, to show that we were featured on there, um, and you know we haven't got any you know letters yet. So, one of the other um, problems that I look at specifically, we'll take this landing page, which is a real one I copied, um, is it's implying endorsement by these companies. Um, maybe it's not the news sites, but whatever it is, the logos at the bottom. Um, and that came up a lot in the last two years in some of the really big FTC cases that hit our industry was that, that was specifically part of what they were saying is that it's false and deceptive because it, your implied claim is that these companies are endorsing your product or your site or whatever it is. So like for this one, it has no disclaimers. It doesn't say anything. It doesn't say as advertised on, as seen on. And I see this all the time where there's just a bunch of random logos at the bottom of the landing page. Um, and you're putting those logos on there because you want the consumer to think that you're cool and these companies like you or they've endorsed your product um, or you're somehow associated with these companies when you're not. This landing page has absolutely nothing to do with Forbes, CNN Money, USA Today, any of these companies. So besides 
you know, the, the issue that you normally think about is, well, am I violating the trademark? Um, you also just have to go back to the rules we were discussing earlier, the false advertising. Um, is it false and deceptive because you're trying to imply that these companies are endorsing your product, your service, whatever it is? Um, and so that's another issue that can come up is using their logos in false light. Um, I've never, I haven't received any cease and desist from Fox or CNN, but other companies, we get them all the, my clients get them all the time um, for using their logo on their site. Walmart does it constantly, Target, yeah. McDonald's. Um, I mean, the second they see, they just have people looking for this all the time. And they will, you know, tell you to remove it. And sometimes, depending on how severe it is or how much money you're making, um, they'll even come after you for your profits. Well, usually isn't it for like Walmart and the rest of them, it's usually in the context of like get a free Walmart gift card. And it's for a lot of these pathway offers that I see that, you know, they're not ever going to get the gift card in the first place, but they're using their logo and it's just their logo and they're making it look like it's Walmart that's advertising it rather than, you know, on a page like this where there's a, you know, there's quite a few logos. Uh, you know, again, I agree with the implied endorsement, but I think the, the biggest defender, is, as far as people that go after people, would be like the Walmarts yeah. and the Targets, but it's because they're using their logo to try to, you know, get people to do a pin submit or something. We see it a lot, too, on the job sites. Um, yeah. It'll be like local listings in your area, and then there will be, you know, the logos from McDonald's, Home Depot, Walmart, whatever, at the bottom. And you're implying that they have jobs and you have job listings for those companies when you don't. Um, for those ones specifically, I've responded to quite a few cease and desist because companies don't like that. They, they're not, they don't, not having you, you know, advertise their job listings for them. They've never even heard of you um, and you're using their logo. And uh, a lot of companies really don't like it and they're, they're starting to go after it a lot more. It used to not be, everyone just ignored it, but definitely in the last couple of years, I, I see a ton of this. Okay, we have about five minutes left, so we'll leave that open for if there's any other questions in the audience. Um, the clients that you have, how often is it the case that, you know, let's say this, this guy had the, the Fox News logo on there? I mean, do they have people at Fox News constantly scrolling through different sites trying to find out if their logo is being abused in any way, shape, or form? Or how do they actually find out about this stuff? Um, there's programs that automatically do it. Like you can pay for services, or it's, you know, it's a computer program, and it just trolls the internet constantly looking for people violating your content. Um, they also have, like, I know McDonald's has a gigantic department, and this is all they do. And I really think they have people actually sitting there just, like, searching the internet. Because um, the way, the places they found it are so random. But there are just software programs that do this for you. And complaints, too. You know, they eventually get some complaints from somebody, a consumer, and it just trickles, you know, its way up to the, the big wigs, and they get somebody on it. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, well, it looks like we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much, attorneys, for uh, all the information that you provided. If you guys have any further questions, they'll be here for a few more minutes. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>